And hello, everyone, and welcome to this Crosslink webinar. Today, as you can see, our topic is how to set up your tax repairs and billing for success in Crosslink 1040 Desktop. And what we mean by success, what a successful prepare and billing setup looks like, is a setup in the software that, ex that helps you process tax returns faster, more efficiently, but also more confidently as well confident in knowing that the tax returns aren't missing any required information and that they're consistent with the way you want to run your business. The goal basically is to set up the software so that it's helping you whenever possible to complete tax returns as quickly and efficiently as we can. And some examples of this uh, can include having prepare info and billing info automatically appear in your tax returns or having your tax repair signature automatically appear in printed uh, tax returns and in PDFs as well. Having uh, tax prep fees automatically calculated in tax returns based on the forms being used in that tax return and being able to quickly apply a discount or an additional custom charge to a tax return. These are the types of, these are the things we're talking about. So if you're interested in learning how to set up the software to accomplish this and more, there's some other things we'll be discussing too, that's precisely what we'll, be, what we'll be reviewing today. So with that, let's head into the new software and see exactly how we can set up our tax repairs and our billing in Crosslink 2019. Now, after with the new software, that's the one I'm using right now that is available for download at this point. When you launch the software for the very first time, you'll most likely encounter something that looks like this, this setup wizard. This will launch automatically uh, when you first run the software. And basically what we have here is a new tool to help you fill out the things that are required for setup. And part of that includes prepare information, as you can see here, and also billing. These are the two that we'll be covering today. We'll also discuss a little bit of logins because that relates to your prepare information. But I just wanted to point this out that you can use this tool to do the setup that we'll be doing today. Uh, or, or and I should say, if at some point you want to prevent this pop-up from appearing, you could always click on this do not show at startup. Once you're all done with this, you can uh, make sure to select that box, click OK, and then you won't be reminded to do this setup every, every time you log in. Now, to start off, let's talk about our prepares and entering in your prepare information. I'll just follow, I'll click on this button using the setup wizard to go to the area that has to do with entering my prepares. And as you can see, I already have a few prepares entered into my system. To add a new prepare, all you would need to do is start off by entering in a prepare ID. And this prepare ID can be whatever you want. It's just essentially a nickname that you would want to give to each of your prepares. In my case, I'm using basically initials, GB, JW, as my prepare ID. And also I have this tax one, but it can really be whatever you want be it letters or numbers. Now, once you type in a prepare ID and click on add, what you'll see are some fields like this. In my case, I've already filled them out, but whatever you type in here for this prepare, this information can transfer over into the tax return. So that's, that's the benefit of, of preparing or creating a prepare record for each one of your tax repairs. You could enter in their SSN or their P10 information. Um, you could enter in all this basic tax office info, um, in, including state ID information here. This is a common question. What exactly does this mean, state identification number? This is basically for certain tax returns that require the tax repairs ID information, such as their driver's license. New York is an example of that, I believe. So if you do fill out this information here, this, this uh, ID information, it will transfer over into any state returns that require it, such as New York. But if your state doesn't handle those types or doesn't require that type of information, you don't have to worry about entering it. You can leave it blank. Only the, the, or only the fields that have an asterisk next to them are the required ones. Now down below, after you complete this uh, tax repair information, and again, the more information you type in here, the better it'll be because all this stuff will transfer over into the return with the exception of the cell phone. That's this cell phone information 
is purely to use this remote sign functionality, which we'll discuss now. Because one of the things that we, this, we uh, one of the benefits you can have, if you want your prepares signature to appear on the printed tax return or on the PDF, you can capture that signature electronically using either the capture signature button or the remote, the remote sign button. Uh, depending on what you want to use, you can use either of these tools. Um, capture signature is if you want to capture the signature right away using either an electronic signature pad or your computer's mouse or your touch screen. Any one of those methods work, but you're basically signing directly onto, onto, the, uh, onto this area using one of those tools, a signature pad, touch screen, or your computer's mouse. Now, if the tax preparer isn't at the office and can't sign at this point, you can use the remote sign functionality as well. This will basically allow you to send a request for the tax for the tax preparer to sign, be it through their email or through their cell phone. Um, once you click OK here, the program will send either an email to the email that you entered here for the tax preparer or a text message to the tax preparer's cell phone. Um, that will guide them to a web page that we have set up so that they can sign remotely. It's essentially a link on that email or on that text message. They tap or click on that, they go to this website where they can enter their information and sign remotely. They submit that signature and it pops into the, to the, to the program automatically. This remote sign functionality, you see, you'll see this for your tax repairs, You'll also see it for your ERO information, um, and you can use this remote sign button as well for your taxpayers and the spouse, your customers, essentially. Whenever you see a remote sign button, just keep that in mind. You can request those electronic signatures remotely via email or text. So that is an example of filling out taxpayer information fully. And again, the benefit of this, the benefit of creating these preparer records is that the information that we type in here can transfer over into the return. So let's take a look at that now and how, what that process looks like. If I close this for now and open up a brand new return, it'll land me on the client data screen. And then at the very top of the client data screen, you'll notice that we have this prep ID box. And if I look towards the bottom, I can see that I have a choices list. If I click on choices, well, there we go. Those are the preparers that I've added to my to the program's database. Um, if I select one of these, let me select the other one here. There we go. And then I go to my 1040. I can see now that my prepare information has populated into, into the areas that are required. And you could always go back. If you want to modify this, you can do it through the setup wizard like we did originally but it's all found under your database menu. This database menu is all about pulling information from the database into the return, populating stuff, information into the tax return. Some of these will accumulate automatically, such as your employers and payers and your bank routing numbers. These, as you enter that information into the return, it'll be saved to the database automatically. However, your paid prepare information is not that, does not work that way you would have to build it first so you can pull it into the return using that choices button. Now there is a way for you to have this information appear automatically without even having to select it here using the choices button. If you do want to do that, if you want your information as soon as you begin the new return to have your paid prepare information already selected or locked in there, what you can do is use logins for that. To, to modify your logins, you want to go to the setup menu and then click login accounts. Here, you can see all the different logins that you have uh, for the software. By default, admin is the primary login. This is the one that you know you have to have in the software. You can create as many additional logins that, as you need them. Technically, each, you know, it's best practice that each tax repair or each user in the software has their individual login in the program. And adding a login, you just click on add here to the right. I'll double click on this one 
purchase is that it's already filled out with the required information. We have the login ID, which is, which is essentially what the person will type in when they're accessing the, the Crosslink program. So instead of admin, for example, they'll type in this. Uh, login name is usually the person's full name. Email and cell phone for the ability to reset the password if they forget. And here's where you enter in the password that they'll be using with this login ID to access the software. It does have, just like the admin login password, it does have to be a strong password with a, you know, at least one capital letter, lowercase letter, letter, special character, number, and so on. And then um, the access level, I'll, I'll get back to this one because this can be important for your preparers, but this is the area that I wanted to show you. Here, under prepare shortcut ID, what we can do is essentially tie in or, or connect the prepare information that we entered into the software already and associate that information with a particular login. So that now, you know, this login, GB, is tied to this prepare shortcut or information. And if I click OK here, whenever this person logs in using their GB login, their prepare information will automatically be inside every single return that they create. And you can do that for any user, including admin. You know, if you want your admin uh, information to be, to be associated with a particular prepare record, just create it and then you can select it here in the login process. Okay, now going back, I did want to talk about the access levels because this, be, this can be important as you're setting up your prepares. Um, the program already comes with a few different access levels built in. Uh, administrator, office manager, and prepare, I believe. This is one I've created myself. And you could always modify what these access levels do by clicking on this access levels button that we have here in the bottom left. And once again, to access this area, what I did is I went to setup and login accounts. If I click on access levels, this is where I can go to modify the different privileges that my users are going to have, the different access that these access levels provide. Um, in my case, for example, I have my GB uh, prepare with this type of access. Everything that you see under access included are the things that this prepare, this person that has this uh, access level as prepare would be able to do. They'll be able to, you know, access appointments and access the chat service. These are all things that they'll be able to do. Over here to the left, under access to select, these are things that this, this type of person cannot do at this point. So I have things like being able to access the billing setup, which we're going to be doing here in a bit, or accessing this level maintenance. Basically what we're doing here is level, level maintenance. Being able to delete a tax return. If you don't want your preparers to delete a tax return, then you want to make sure that, they're, that they have an access level that does not provide this privilege. Invoice modification. This is another one that kind of relates to billing, being able to modify the invoice and the return. So if you don't want the preparer to be able to provide discounts or, or um, uh, any add, add additional charges, then you'll most likely want to get rid of this privilege, being able to modify the invoice and the return. And then user access setup is essentially going to the login accounts area that we're at right here. I don't want them to be able to go in there and modify this themselves, so I've removed that access. But I definitely urge you, if you do want to limit the functionality that your preparers can have in the software, to come in here to login accounts, take a look at your access levels, and take a look at the access levels that your preparers, that all your users currently have, and make sure that they're using the correct one. You know, you can have a separate preparer with the same administrator rights, that your admin login has, like in the case of Jeff here, he has the same privileges as I, as I do as an admin. But if you need to limit that, you can do so by simply choosing the access level using this drop-down box. You choose the access level for the preparer here, and you modify the access level by using this button here on the bottom left. Okay. Now at this point, what I'd like to do, that is the basics of preparing a, a, or setting up a prepare. 
um, mod adding the prepare to the database under here, pay prepares, and then potentially going in and creating a login for them so that they have specific access levels in the software, and then also so that their information can pop in automatically. They won't have to manually select using that choices button who they are as a preparer. Now, as far as billing goes, that can be modified under the setup menu, and here's the billing setup area. If I click on this, we'll go through each one of these tabs that we see here. Um, the first tab under general, uh, there really typically isn't much that you have to do here unless you're trying to do something very specific. Um, I, I do want to point out these four lines that you see here. These four lines will, will appear blank when you, uh, when you first install the program, but you can modify this. This is a, basically information that, we, that will be printed on the billing invoice or that will appear in the PDF of the billing invoice. So when you print the return, and if that return includes the invoice page, these uh, whatever you type in here will appear as part of the billing invoice. Some folks, they type in their office contact information, you know, the name of the office, address, maybe a, a telephone number and, and, e and uh, email. Other folks, they may use this as a way to enter in a thank you message on that invoice. Um, it's really up to you. And it is optional, so you don't even have to use it if you don't want to. At the bottom, we have some very specific options that you, know, that you would select if you want to perform that action when it comes to the billing. Most of these, again, are, I would say are, are not modified. Um, it's, it's only certain people that want to perform certain actions. So I'd, I'd urge you to take a look at these options as well. See if any of them strike your interest. Some of these descriptions may not be the best right away. When you, when you read this, it may not make sense. But I do want to mention that if you hover your mouse over any one of these options, essentially like the area to enter information or to check the box, it also provides you with additional information about that option. Some of these descriptions, I would say, are more uh, ex better explain what exactly the option is for. On screen, when you're looking at it here, it's kind of condensed. But if you hover your mouse again over these options, it'll provide you with additional information that might better explain what the option is. However, when it comes to actually modifying the billing, all that is handled through these tabs after the general tab. The most commonly used one is this form billing tab. What we're doing here is, we're, is this is basically where we can go to enter in a price associated with any federal form that you can attach to the tax return. You can see here that I have a big list of all the federal forms. Just because I have this big list doesn't necessarily mean that I have to enter in a price for each one of these forms. What you have to do is essentially enter in the price for the forms that you want to charge for. Anything else, you can leave blank. That's perfectly fine. And over here to the right, you'll notice that we have these three columns where we can enter information, base quantity, base price, and per item. I'll explain the, the, the differences between these three in a, here in a bit. But the most, the easiest one to use, the easiest of these columns to use, I would say, is the per item column. What we're doing here is we're saying that, however, uh, it'll be charging this amount per form. So let's say if I'm on the W-2, I want to charge, I want to start charging for my W-2s. If I enter in $10, what will happen is that in the tax return, it'll, it'll charge the customer $10 per W-2 that happens to be in that return. Pretty straightforward. In the case of the 1040, I can, I can use per item as well. You know, the 1040, there could only be one 1040 per tax return. You, can have, you can't have multiple returns, multiple 1040s in the same return. Um, so you can use that. It's just going to charge it the one time and it will not charge it again because it, you know you can't do that in the software. So you can use the per item, even if it, you can't add the form multiple times, you can certainly use that per item column to calculate the fees. Now the base price, this one works a little bit differently. What we're doing here is we're entering in essentially a flat fee that will be charged. So let's say uh, my schedule C. I just want to charge 
let's say $50 for my Schedule C. And then if I'm using the base price column, you want to make sure to use the base quantity column right next to it because here is where you'll enter in how many forms are going to trigger this base price cost. What that mean, and what I mean by that is if I enter in a one here, what I'm telling the software is that for that first Schedule C that I add to the tax return, the customer is going to be charged $50. If I add another Schedule C, nothing will happen. It's not going to charge anything extra. Uh, I can keep adding a third and a fourth. It's only going to charge that base price of $50. And it's going to charge it as soon as I enter or as soon as I add that first Schedule C. However, if I change this to a two, now what I'm doing is I'm saying that the program is going to charge $50 as soon as I enter that second uh, Schedule C. So essentially, the first Schedule C that I add to a tax return is going to be free. There's, there's going to be no charge associated with that. As soon as I enter that second, w, uh, that second Schedule C, that's when the $50 pops in to be charged to the customer. The third one, again, I haven't configured anything for that third one, so it's going to be no cost. Same thing with the fourth and fifth and so on. However, if I did want to charge any, anything extra for that third Schedule C or that fourth one, you can do that by entering in or using that per item column that we were talking about before. If I type in $10 here, now what I've done is I've said that the software is going to charge $50 for that second W2, as soon as that second, w, uh, excuse me, as soon as that second Schedule C pops into the return, it's going to charge $50. And then if I enter in a third Schedule C, it's going to be $10. If I do a fourth one, it'll be an additional $10. So as you can see, you can be pretty flexible as to how you want to charge for this. You have multiple options that you can you can um, uh, achieve by entering in the prices in these specific columns. Depending on where you enter in the price, that will determine how the fees are calculated. Okay. So again, as a recap, you want to charge per form, use the per item column. Want to charge a flat fee, use the base price column, but make sure to use that base quantity column here as well. If you're using base price, use base quantity because you're telling the software when the base price is going to be charged. Is it the first form that will trigger that charge? Is it the second form? And so on. Okay. Now here, I'm just looking at the federal forms, but if you click on this drop-down box here, you'll see all the states available to us as well. So if you did want to modify state or enter in tax prep fees associated with, with a state return, you just pick the state and use the same three columns to enter your information. Now, I am under the form billing tab, so that means I'm just looking at the forms in a tax return. But if you really wanted to get a bit more granular and start charging for worksheets, you can do so as well. Here we have all the worksheets, and it's using the same method, federal first, and then you can choose any states below. Or if you wanted to, you could even charge for specific lines within a form or a, uh, or a worksheet. So, you know, as soon as you enter in, um, information on a specific field, that if there's information on the other income field on the 1040, it'll charge that amount to the customer. I would say these are, fair, these are more rarely used, the worksheets and line items. Most folks, they just focus on the 1040. And, you know, I would say you don't even have to, if, you're, if, you, if you just want to charge a flat fee for the return and not uh, you know, worry about um, the forms that are being added. Let's say you just wanted to charge $500 for preparing a tax return, just a flat fee. Then in that case, you could just enter in the amount, let's say 500 for the 1040, and then you're good. Every return that you start from here on in is just automatically going to have that $500 charge or whatever amount that you use uh, starting off. And then you could always, assuming that you have the access level, you could always, you know, modify that, uh, provide discounts, um, add additional charges depending on the services used. 
So it's really about how you would prefer to do it for your business. Now, speaking of discounts and custom charges, you have the ability, let me close this for a bit, because I just want to show you in the invoice where this comes into play. You have the ability to charge additional things. We have these three lines here that you can enter an extra charge manually. $100. You can type that in. Again, assuming that you have that access level to modify the invoice that we saw before. Um, and then there's also this predefined charge area. This, you're typing it in manually. The predefined charge area is more if you wanted to use this choices button to be able to quickly select a discount, or excuse me, an, an additional charge rather, to this tax return. To, to and as you can see here, if I click on choices, my list is currently empty, and the discount area is right here, predefined discount. You have the same ability to add a dis discounts from a list, assuming that I have you know this list built. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to go to setup, billing setup. Take a look at my discounts. And then this is where I can build that list of uh, discounts. So if I have, let's say, a family discount, I can enter in a percentage amount, 25% off the total price. You can just enter in the whole amount uh, number there. Um, or I can use an amount, $25 off, as opposed to 25% off. Or I can even use both. Um, I can say, uh, let's do a, a percentage of 25 and a discount amount of 50. And what I've done here is I've said to the software that first, if I apply this discount, it's going to take 25% off the total amount of the, uh, the fee, of the tax prep fee. But it's going to cap that discount at 25% off at $50. So this is the max amount that the um, that the 25 percent is going to reach it's not going to go more than fifty dollars you know if I get rid of this 25 percent of a of a pretty expensive tax return could be more than fifty dollars so that's why it might be a good idea to come in here and decide what your cap would be or even if you want to establish that cap of a of a discount percentage um, you can do, do so by entering that amount here and as you build this, click on OK here. Actually, let me cancel this for now. Go back to my discounts. This is where you can build the discounts, like I said. And let me just type that in again real quick. And I'll type in $25. The same thing, or actually something very similar, is this custom charges. This is what we saw before when it comes to the predefined charge. If you want to build that list, of additional charges that can be selected with the choices button. This is where you can go to enter in and build that list of, um, of additional charges and then enter the appropriate amount for that. When it comes to the custom charges, there's not the ability to provide a percentage amount. It's just an amount. Um, so again, you can type in extra fee, the amount, and then you'll be able to select it from that list. And then for those customers that may be using Protection Plus, if you've signed up to offer Protection Plus at your tax uh, at your tax office on our on our website, you can click on this custom settings. You should see the Protection Plus as a, or audit protection as available. And then I wanted to point out this area over here to the right because this is where you can modify the add-on fee. And uh, and if you did want to have an add-on fee associated with this service, the base price. For Protection Plus is $44.95, but you can add up to that the total amount being um, the total amount for Protection Plus that can be charged is like $99.99. So um, uh, you could add um, you know up to like $64 to this and and be able to, and and have that as an add-on fee that you will receive every time you sell one of these services. This audit protection. So keep that in mind. This is the only area where you would modify that add-on fee uh, for Protection Plus. So if you did want to have that add-on fee, you want to go here to your building setup under custom settings. And then since we're on this page, I wanted to point out this auto-add auto financials. 
and auto add non-financials. What I'm doing here is, is telling the software to automatically add protection plus to auto add financials means any tax return that has a bank product. Auto add non-financials is any tax return that doesn't have a bank product. They're some other type of, you know, a regular IRS deposit or direct deposit. So if you did want to um, have that protection plus automatically appear in tax returns, you can make sure to select these check boxes. Otherwise, you could always add the form manually if you choose not to. Okay. Now I'll click on OK here. And I did want to point out this because this will most likely happen uh, whenever you go to set up and billing setup for the first time. If you haven't set up a billing uh, a billing scheme is what we call it at all, you'll most likely encounter this after you fill out some information here and click OK. What the program is asking you is to essentially create a name for this billing scheme, for this, life, for this uh, list of prices that you entered under form billing and discounts and custom charges. It's going to associate that. It's going to bundle it all up and it's going to place it under this name. So it can really be whatever you want. I'll say, you know, my prices. And then once I click OK here, you'll also most likely see this message telling me, you know, the program may not have a, a default billing. Do you want to make this the, the default? Do you want to make this billing, the one that you configured just now, the default for the software? So if that's the case, if you do want to start using this billing that you may have modified um, um, automatically so that every return is working off this billing scheme, then in that case, you want to click yes. Now from here on in, whenever I prepare a new return, it's automatically going to be using that billing and taking that into, into consideration. Um, however, let me go back. just want to do something in here and make sure that I've got some prices so I can show you what it looks like. That's enough for now, I think. So here we are in this return. And you may notice if I add a W2, let's say, and go back to my invoice, I entered into the software that I was going to be charging, you know, amounts for the 1040 and the W2, but this tax return, it's not really showing me anything in the invoice. It's not calculating those fees automatically like, uh, like we were promised. And that's because this tax return was created prior to modifying the billing, the billing setup. Um, if you have any returns that were created before you went into setup and billing setup, in that case, you have to do an action in order to reload the billing and populate this form with the, with the prices that you set up. From here on in, you know, for if, every time I start a new return, it's going to be taking that default billing and it's going to be using that. But for any returns that already exist, like this one that I created prior to modifying my billing, what you would need to do is go to the return menu and then choose reload billing right here in the middle, basically. You could also use control U as a keyboard shortcut. Once I click on that, now you can see that the program is taking into consideration all those pricings that I entered into the billing setup. So again, that's a very common uh, misunderstanding or confusion that happens with new customers. They, uh, they, have, they may have tax returns already in the program. And then after that, they start modifying the billing and they're not seeing the billing appear in the return. So just keep that in mind. You could always reload this billing by going to the return menu and select this option here. And if you go to setup and billing setup, the program reminds you, or it'll try to remind you at the very bottom here. So you can find this keyboard shortcut at the bottom of your billing setup as well. Okay. Now, one last thing I wanted to mention about billing especially if you are using a, uh, if the taxpayer decides not to use a bank product, if they're paying your office directly, if they're using an IRS direct deposit or IRS printed check, and they have to pay your office directly, I would definitely urge you to use the payments button that appears here on the toolbar. This will allow you to keep track of those payments being made to your office directly. If it's a bank product, you know, then we don't have to worry about that because all those tax prep fees will be deposited automatically and you as a tax 
office, you know, the tax prepare, you'll get paid. Um, but if they're paying cash, if the customer is paying you directly, you can use that payments button to keep track of that, selecting how the customer paid, what the amount was, they owe 250, so I'll say they paid the whole thing. I'll click on save, and now the program has a record of that payment being made. And then, you know, if you run any reports, if you run reports about your billing, I was saying if you run reports such as this management dashboard reporting tool, this is a tool that you can use to, to see what's going on with your finances, especially this uh, financials totals report that we see here. There are different types of reports that you can run about your business here using this management dashboard tool. But in the case of financial totals, if I click on go, I can see, for example, this return created today. I was supposed to get, and this will take into consideration all the returns that you've created for the, for the day, how much money you were supposed to collect, how much was actually collected, and the balance. So this is what you want to see, that you don't really have a balance at the end of the day. In the case of this return, um, or these returns, I've, I uh, apparently I was charged 140, but I haven't collected that money. And the reason why I haven't collected that money, at least according to the system here, is because I never used that payments button to register the payment being made. And again, this is only for those returns that are non-bank product returns, so that means that the customer has to pay you directly. So just keep that in mind. And you can find that payments button inside of the tax return, you know, for that one particular customer that you're looking at, or it's outside of the tax return here. You can click on that and then type the social of that, or name or social of that taxpayer and search for that record. But with that, those are the most important aspects of using your preparer setup, going into here and preparing and, and configuring your preparers, and then also modifying your billing, all the tabs that we see there. We selected my prices as the default prices. If you remember that question that where it asks, do you want to make this the default billing? If by chance you need to change that, if you added or created an additional billing, scheme and you want to modify that, what the, what the default um, billing setup is, you can do so by going to the setup menu and then choosing office setup. Here under def, uh, excuse me, under uh, general, you'll find the billing for the 1040. This is the one that I selected as the default one. And you also have, keep in mind that if you're using the program for corporate tax returns, your 1120s, 1120s, you can do a very similar setup by going to the business returns tab and then just going to the same under the business returns tab. 